in the video, How to Read a Poem, I suggested that uh, uh, become the poem. But then I realized that the concept needed unpacking. So in this video, I will explore what I mean by to become a poem. Hello, I'm Jane. Welcome to Jane Chu Seasons. Right, so how do you become a poem? Um, in that last video, I mentioned that in order to become a poem, one must love it. Upon reflection, you could also say that you could become a poem you hate because the things that we feel strongly for are the things that it's easier for us to become. So what's the difference between loving a poem and liking a poem? I said that to like a poem, it's not enough to become the poem because that's mild. When you like something, it's pleasing, but it's mild. It doesn't really cling to you. It doesn't really go inside you. It's not that inseparable. It's something you can live without. When you love something, you want more of it, right? So to give you a better example, I'm going to show you a poem I like and a poem I love. So this poem is uh, it's by uh, Wang Wei and it's translated by Wita Biner. So Wang Wei is a Tang Dynasty poet. He's a Chinese poet. I'm reading this from Zen Poems, uh, Every Man's uh, Library Pocket Poets. So the title is Lined. You who have come from my old country, tell me what has happened there. Was the poem when you passed my silken window, silken window, <laughs> opening its first cold blossom? This is like a really beautiful poem. It's nice, it's interesting, yet I don't love it. Um, if I was yearning for something like an old home, an old country, um, for something that's past, if I had a really strong yearning for something like this, maybe I could love this poem. But although it's relatable, it's not strongly relatable, it's nice, but it doesn't really pull me. However, here's an example of a poem I love, and this is from Tang Dynasty, and it's Su Dong Po, no, this is Song Dynasty, Su Dong Po, and the title is Enjoying the Peonies. Peonies, English is so hard, at the Temple of Good Fortune. Enjoying the peonies at the Temple of Good Fortune. In my old age, I adorn myself with flowers, blush not. It is the flowers that she blush for decking an old man's head. Half tipsy, I fumbled along home, and men must be laughing at me, for along the road, half the folk have, folk, uh, have hooked up their blind. So this poem is charming, it's inviting, it's like, I feel like I could read this poem for like my whole life and love it. It sort of speaks to something within me, it's agreeable to me. Um, it warms in me inside out. So this is like a poem you love, it really clings to you, it clings to something profoundly without within you, deeply within you. Um, so that's an example of a poem you like and a poem you love. The second step or the second way of becoming a poem is to believe in the poem. And this basically also connects to what I was saying previously, like the poem I just read by Su, Su Dong Po. It's, um, I, I believe this poem, it adheres to my principles. So the poem, you, the poem you believe is a poem that's already like metered into your values, it basically exhibits your ethical, um, the ethics you hold dear, things that you abstain, like uh, you hold an abstain, like uh, yeah, so here's an example. Uh, and this one is by Emily Dickinson, because I believe in Emily Dickinson. So the poem is uh, 435. Uh, much madness is divine sense to a descending eye, much sense the stuckest madness. Tis the majority in this as all prevail. Ascent and you are sane, demur you are straightway dangerous and handled with a chain. So this is like a poem that's already like, I, you can think of it as like a motto of my life motto. This is something I already believe in and then to find it on the pages and then you're like, oh, there's somebody else who sees things this way I see it. But then they could put it in verse and 
it's even more beautiful so it's like yes poems you believe are those poems that bring that in fact that like, yes when you read them you're already halfway through it like you're already half of it it's already sort of in you so you realize you recognize it on a more conscious level and you're more accepting of it so poems like this you can easily become the third uh, one is a bit tricky and I have a backstory for the one I'm going to give you, the example I'm going to give you, but it's uh, to become the opposite poem. So basically what this means is that the poem you read, you see yourself in it and you realize that it's like a premonition of what you could be if you sort of uh, keep things the way they are, if you still follow the path that you're, um, you're walking or chording. Um, and it sort of shows you to yourself, like your future self to yourself, and you'll be like, no, I don't want to become that. So you become something different. That's like what I mean by a premonition, sort of predict your future. Here's an example. And before I share this, so in college, I was like, God, what is that? <laughs> then I was, I was reading Blake's uh, Marriage of Heaven and Hell, and I was like, oh, God, interested. Uh, when I read this poem by Thomas Hardy, I had already gotten very close to that uh, boundary. I was already crossing that line of uh, trying to just practice faith and love in God but this poem really ushered me forward so I'm going to read it it's half and you already probably know it so if but some vengeful God would call to me from up the sky and laugh thou suffering then know that thy sorrow is my ecstasy that thy lost loss is my hate profiting then would I bed clench myself and die still by the sins of error unmerited have ease in that a power fuller than I had willed and met at me the tears I shed but not so how arrives a joy lies slain and why and blooms the best hope ever sown crass casualty abstracts the sun and rain and dies in time for gladness, cast a moan. This purblind doomsters had as readily strong bleases, up, uh, bleases about my pilgrimage as pain. Ooh, it's like, it's like you always get that chill when you read this part. Okay, I get it. But look, so it's like this poem for me was like, it's a premonition. Like this, I don't want to be this persona i don't want to be the speaker of this poem but i was sort of heading there this is like it talks of like agony but then it's an intellectual agony that the speaker so it has in a sense basically created for themselves it's like this sophisticated world of self-torture self-torture is that a word self-torture self-torturing that this speaker is enjoying is like an auroboros ring that's like really terrible to put oneself in and i don't like to suffer and i really don't like to inflict suffering upon myself consciously or unconsciously so like this was a warning for me have you ever felt that have you ever read a poem and you're like or read something you're like oh this is where i'm heading i must it stop in the name of love <laughs> i must stop so yeah those are like um the three steps to love the poem it's easy to become it to believe in the poem it's easy to become it uh and then to basically not become the poem you see you become something different all right uh please let me know your thoughts in the comment section uh yeah, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.